I'm Nikki Jovakik from Look Up Strata, and for this webinar session, I'm joined by Christopher Karen from Karen Benson Lawyers. Chris is joining us today to speak about building defects in New South Wales and ACT strata properties. Today, we'll be speaking about what happens when you discover defects in the building and the decision making process that follows. What goes through the minds of apartment owners when faced with building defects and large repair bills and what strategies can be put in place to address those building defects. After the presentation, we'll move into Q&As. Before we begin, I'd like to mention that the information contained in this session, including the discussions that arise from submitted questions, is not legal advice and should not be relied upon as legal advice. You should seek independent advice before acting on the information contained in this session. Welcome, Chris, and thanks for joining us today. Christopher has worked as a lawyer for almost 30 years. He's been involved in all forms of dispute resolution, including litigation, arbitration, and alternative dispute resolution in a range of jurisdictions in Australia. Christopher has also had a number of years experience in contract drafting, risk analysis, and providing general construction advice, having been involved in a whole range of construction projects from minor works to projects worth billions of dollars. Christopher holds a Masters of Laws, is at Law Society of New South Wales accredited specialist in commercial litigation and has published in a range of law journals and associated publications. In the last 12 years, he's brought his specialist construction industry knowledge to the strata sector and now only acts for owners corporations in New South Wales and ACT. Karen Benson Lawyers appears regularly in our Strata newsletters, keeping the Look Up Strata audience up to date with changes to legislation and interesting cases. Christopher, Alison Benson and the team at Karen Benson Lawyers regularly contribute to Q&As received from our audience. Just one of the New South Wales Q&A articles the Karen Benson team have contributed to receives almost 3,000 views a month. Karen Benson have been contributing content to Look Up Strata since June 2014. Welcome, Chris, and thanks so much for joining us. Thanks, Nikki. It's, uh, it's great to be here this morning. Um, I was just watching the chat. You've already got uh, 30 comments. That's That must be a record in any Zoom meeting I've been in. Um, lots of people from Canberra and New South Wales, but also I've noticed a few people from Queensland and Victoria as well. Um, which is interesting and um, as Nikki indicated what the talk today is about is not so much the law um, and the technical issues around building defects but rather the human reactions to um, to hearing the news that you have building defects in your property. Um, this is not something that um, it's not a topic that I suppose you hear regularly on um, and the things that I'll be talking about are really my own observations of human behaviour. So it is by no means the final word on these matters. Um, this is simply my observations as to how people react and respond. Um, and, you know, they're, they're certainly open to contest. Um, so the two kind of broad issues that I wanted to talk about is what the kind of stages people go through when they realize that they have building defects in their apartment. And then secondly, um, the kind of um, difference between an apartment block that actually responds in a constructive way and uh, an apartment block that does nothing or is inert and is seemingly incapable, incapable of actually responding to the defects. Um, so, um, so the first, the first sort of concept of how people respond to building defects in their apartment block, um, it, it comes from the root of it. It comes from an idea that probably everyone on this um, conference call has heard, and that is the five steps to death and dying. Um, so uh, Elizabeth Kubler Ross. Um, wrote a book in 1969. She was a Swiss American psychiatrist and the book was called On Death and Dying. And it identified five stages that people go through when they realize that they have a terminal illness. And the stages are denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and acceptance. And um, 
Now, it was the first work of its kind. And as I understand it, the medical literature has kind of refined these ideas. And um, uh, but, you know, the, the, the broad concept is still there. And <clears throat> having, ha having done work in this field for now over 12 years, um, it's always struck me as odd as a lawyer when you communicate advice, but then the advice is received very differently by owners. Um, and it kind of set me thinking about, well, why is that? Um, um, th there is typically a reticence to engage lawyers by everyday people because people think that they are expensive and they are expensive, but used commercially, um, lawyers, a good lawyer, should be able to get an outcome that on the whole benefits the owner's corporation. That is, whilst there is a cost in legal fees, the net benefit well outweighs legal fees that were incurred. <clears throat> now, so the five stages, broadly speaking, applied to building defects, as it were, uh, firstly, denial. And um, that stage is basically one where we live in the 21st century. Anyone who's been alive for more than kind of 30 years has seen the technological developments that have occurred. <clears throat> we can put people on the moon. We can do all sorts of incredible things. And yet somehow you, this, this apartment that you bought for 800,000, whatever it is, leaks. And that's the first sort of obstacle, as it were, in the sense that people can't get their head around the fact that, um, that, that this building actually doesn't function the way it was intended to function. Um, and that is a shock. And sometimes um, that shock is accompanied by a denial of the fact. Um, that denial takes many forms in the sense that it might be at first that there's only one or two units that are leaking. And so the inclination can be of the executive committee to think, well, that those people are just, they just people who complain about nothing. It's a very minor issue. But after a time, um, the leaking doesn't abate and, and perhaps becomes more widespread within the building. And therefore the denial phase is not something that can go on for too long because eventually um, you know, proof is brought as to the fact that the leaks are occurring. <clears throat> Most people who buy apartments are not aware that, you know, building defects in new apartments are quite widespread. Um, um, you know, there have been studies by various bodies in Australia and overseas that attest to this. And the most frequently uh, quoted statistic is that uh, is one from the City Futures Centre at New South Wales Uni that did a study that found that 85% of buildings, um, I think the study was from 2010 or thereabouts, that 85% of buildings suffered from, built recently, suffered from building defects, which is an extraordinarily high statistic. But most people who buy an apartment are unaware of it. When the defects arise, there's this shock and, and then there's this denial that this can't be happening to me. Um, now, once, um, once they can no longer deny the fact that the building defects exist, people then move on to the stage of anger. And that is basically anger, firstly, usually directed at the strata manager because that person is the most accessible person by the owner, but then quickly kind of moves towards the builder developer. And then uh, after a time, you know, the builder developer perhaps isn't responding and so, it'll move to the local council or the local member or whoever it is. Um, now, the thing about this stage is some people like to be angry and, um, and uh, so they will get stuck on this stage for some time. The thing about the stage is, is that people are not machines and so they don't, and they're not predictable. And so they don't move through five, the five stages in a, in, a, in a particular sequence necessarily and also they move through stages at different rates. And one of, the, uh, one of the purposes of this talk is to inform 
people have to deal with owners uh, who are suffering in this way, that is either strata managers or property managers or executive committee members, that they, they get some insight as to what's going on in the minds of the people who are suffering from these defects. I've been in, um, I've been in meetings where with an executive committee and you know there's 10 people around a room around a table and and there's one person who is just so angry about the fact that there are defects in the building because the financial consequences and so forth and everyone else around the building has kind of either got to acceptance or is in depression or whatever it is but this one person is just still angry even though everyone has kind of moved on beyond the anger stage um, and that can happen. Um, some people will never get off the anger stage. Um, so uh, it's just important to remember that <clears throat> it's, these things aren't, don't, people sometimes get stuck on stages and never move beyond them. And then, and some people move to acceptance very quickly. People are able to detach themselves from the emotional kind of consequences of what's happened. You know, people who, whose unit is an investment unit. It's simply um, an, you know, an asset that's there for return on investment. Um, for them, perhaps more so than an owner occupier, um, they can move to acceptance very quickly because they see a problem. They don't attach emotions to the problem. They just look for a solution to the problem. So everyone is a bit different. And it's just important to remember that emotionally people respond differently to these problems. So anger is that stage. Now, most people, I said not everyone, but most people kind of um, can't be angry for you know, extended indefinite periods of time. And so they can move on to bargaining. And that is basically, look, um, there is a problem and I've tried initially to kind of deal with it, uh, perhaps not in a very effective way, but I've tried. And it's something that's not going to be easily solved. And so my response to that is basically to delay um, my addressing the matter. And that is, I will deal with this when I finish my exams, when I get back from overseas, when I get that new job, you know, whatever it is that um, enables them or facilitates them putting off and delaying procrastinating, whatever you want to call it. Um, there will, many people have things going on in their lives and they don't, they just kind of feel at this stage I have, you know, my bandwidth is just not big enough to deal with everything that I'm supposed to be dealing with. So I will put this off. I mean, typically also I find that um, owners corporations won't engage lawyers until they've suffered a significant amount. Um, it's unusual for owners to, um, you know, it's changing because people, I suppose, over time have become more aware of the problem and have become more aware of the limitation periods that require them to act more quickly. But, um, but you know, as a general proposition, people don't engage lawyers until there's a real problem and they've suffered, a, a, you know, an, a, a, at least a minimum amount. Um, you know, a, a consultant, a building consultant that I use a lot, kind of sometimes when we've met with a committee and, that, you know, we've given cost estimates, whatever, and they haven't accepted them, he always remarks to me, well, they haven't suffered enough yet, you know, they need to kind of realise the, mag the magnitude of the problem that they have. And once they do that, they will then realise that they really don't have a choice. Um, but um, so th that's an element to it as well. So having gone through a period of procrastination and bargaining, we then move on to depression. And depression is a situation where, you know, you've talked to your strata manager, they're useless. You know, the, the builders come, the builders kind of said he'd do stuff and made promises. And, you know, someone with a silicon gun has been seen around the, the complex a bit. And you know they've kind of bodged up some of the cracks in the around the windows or whatever it is, um, but there's been no real kind of large scale work. There's been no real kind of monetary investment by the builder in addressing these problems. 
and we still have the problems. And so Australian Rangers hopeless, the builders hopeless, the developers putting you back onto the builder, you know, the local member really is not doing anything and the council's kind of said nothing and it's all too hard and it's all hopeless and no one knows what to do and, you know, I'm just lost. And so people can fall into this funk where it's just, you know, I don't know what to do and it's a bit hopeless and whatever else. And then finally, um, hopefully they reach at the fifth stage and the final stage, which is, which is acceptance. And that's basically a um, situation where there is a realisation that, look, this is my apartment. This is my problem. No one else is going to kind of come riding over the hill on a white horse to fix this for me. I need to actually take responsibility for this problem and, you know, and focus on it. Um, and that can be hard for people because that's going to involve people um, spending a lot of time, a lot of mental effort, some money um, on something that they'd rather not focus on. Um, you know, there's much more interesting things in life to do than reading, you know, um, structural engineering reports or water ingress reports, or whatever else. Um, you know, these things are, are difficult concepts to get your head around. Um, and so naturally people are disinclined to um, become involved in that process. But um, accept, part of the acceptance is basically understanding that uh, I need to take this stuff on and take responsibility for it. It's my asset. No one else is going to step up to the plate for me. And so, um, so that's the way it's going to be. Um, now, that's kind of um, the synopsis on, um, on my death and dying spiel. Now, the accuracy of these things is open to debate. And I understand that people kind of might take a different view on it. But this is kind of my sort of snapshot um, approach. Um, I think that... Um, it's just helpful for, for, for people who are dealing with people who are going through this process to understand the emotions that come out of it. Now, the second kind of, kind of part or communication piece that I want to kind of put is um, how um, owners organise themselves internally. Um, just through sheer experience, what I've noticed is when I walk into a room full of owners and everyone is under 35, I know we have a problem, or more particularly, they have a problem. Um, nothing ever seems to happen in those buildings. Um, no, you know, you, you can give advice till you're blue in the face, you know, you can technical and legal and otherwise, but I just seen th those. Um, buildings with those younger kind of owners just seem to be unable to organise themselves. And, and um, on the other hand, the buildings that have been, have got the best results um, um, tend to have a particular person in them. And that person in the main is a kind of older person you know, recently retired, um, married, upper middle management. Um, and, and that person basically is used to dealing with lawyers, used to managing people, um, um, has, you know, is retired and now has time on their hands and is looking for a project. Typically, uh, it's a male and so his wife wants him out of the house. Um, you know, that sort of guy is the person who um, is a bit of a, a clipboard commando and he will kind of get out and start door knocking and uh, talking to people and communicating. Um, I do have um, a, a building uh, that involved a middle-aged Korean woman and she was quite frightening in her organizational capacities, uh, very intimidating. And she was um, that person as well. So basically, when I walk into a room of people under 35, the impression I get because of the inaction is basically these people are time poor. They either have young families with young kids. Um, and so they're just flat chat, just getting from one day to the next. 
they're um, establishing careers they're in a phase of their career where you know they're working longer hours or whatever it is they're not <clears throat> they don't have experience of dealing with lawyers they don't have experience of managing people um, these are the things that i think cause problems in those uh, those buildings with those sort of demographics um, uh, i mean sometimes the drivers to these things are that, that can kind of trigger a trigger a coalescence of owners is the fact that um, in in the AC in, in all states there is an obligation for the owners corporation or body corporate to repair and maintain the common property and if there's a failure to do that then lot owners start suing the owners corporation and that then forces the owners corporation to take it seriously um, now typically um, I mean, that communication piece that um, someone who's a bit more experienced can bring is really important because um, in a lot of these buildings with these problems, unless you communicate well with owners and explain to them, this is the way forward, this is what we're doing, this is the plan, this is the time frame, this is how it's going to happen, unless you can explain to people that you know, things are happening, then people are going to start ACAT, NCAT, VCAT, QCAT, whatever CAT proceedings against the owners corporation, getting those orders, requiring the owners corporation to repair and maintain the common property. And so as part of that communication piece, it's also really important to have information nights, um, regular updates, one-on-one -on -one meetings where people are told, okay, this is what the plan was, you know, uh, we're going to go from A to B to C. We're now moving on to B. Um, these are the things that, that have happened. Um, these are the things we expect to happen. Generally speaking, I find that when you have those, you know, efforts to communicate to people so they know what's going on, people will refrain from those NCAT, ACAT proceedings. And because they know that um, no one really wants to sue their neighbours, um, um, and so if they can see that things are happening, that they're being listened to, that, um, that things ultimately will be fixed, then most people will hold off on those sorts of lot owner, uh, owners corporation actions. Um, I think a, a few other uh, points to make in that regard um, and things to look for, be aware of, um, firstly, Buildings that have high levels of tenants or high levels of tenancies, um, typically tenants really don't care if the place leaks unless you know there's mold or something, and so they're not necessarily going to be reporting um, you know minor leaks or um, minor issues. Um, so be aware of that. Um, buildings with higher owner occupier rates tend to be better in dealing with defects. Um, Bear in mind that the limitation actions, legal actions, ha always have limitation periods associated with them, and so you do need to commence court proceedings before the limitation periods expire. That seems to be a common misunderstanding amongst owners that somehow, if you're talking to the builder and the builder's promised to do things, then you don't need to commence court proceedings. That's just simply not the case. Many times, bills will you will talk and say that they're going to do things in an effort to lull owners into thinking that it's all being dealt with or will be dealt with, and then such that they don't commence proceedings by the time they're supposed to. And then all of a sudden they find themselves, it's too late to commence court proceedings and they've lost rights. And so the leverage that they had over the builder is now gone. And the builder can simply say, well, it's too late. I don't have to do anything now. Be, be conscious of the fact that builders and developers are well aware of the limitation periods that are associated with legal rights and that they the unscrupulous ones out there not all of them are unscrupulous but you know some of them are they will lull owners into um, uh, a sense that things are going okay and will be taken care of just to drag you over that limitation period so the commencement of court proceedings is required um, if you're coming close to a limitation period, don't think that you just have unlimited time to take action against a builder. Um, also, it's important um, that executive committee members are aware that they are liable 
um, for negligent acts or omissions in running the building. And that can, in theory, include failure to take action when they've been advised that they should be taking action. Executive committee members are insured for negligent acts or omissions. One of the insurance policies under your building insurance policy is a directors and officers type liability insurance policy. It's an office bearers liability insurance policy, and it does cover you for negligent acts or omissions. It's not common for executive committee members to be sued, but I was talking to a broker at an SCI event uh, late uh, early this year, and he told me he had come across nine um, incidences of claims made by executive committee members in circumstances where there were allegations that they'd failed to act properly um, in response to building defects claims. Also, um, sometimes owners can be um, just cost too cost conscious, and they can negotiate. Like there are nine in different insurance policies under your building insurance policy, and sometimes they can. Um, underinsure or opt to not insure or not to take insurance in all nine policies. For example, owners corporations do have a legal indemnity policy for $50,000 for legal costs if they are sued by a lot owner. And so I've seen owners corporations negotiate that out of their policy in return for a cheaper premium and, and then be sued. And then, you know, when you explain to them that that they, they've got this policy of insurance that covers them for $50,000 worth of legal fees. And then you look at the policy and realize, oh, they opted out of that for a cheaper premium. Um, just be aware that, that that can come back to bite you very quickly. Um, I, I note that I'm at 10.28 and, um, <laughs> and we did so I took for 20 minutes. So look, these are some, these are some broad ideas of just that I've kind of, you know, cogitated on over the last 12 or so years, acting for owners corporations. Um, you know, it's not really legal advice. Um, this is a bit of an odd kind of seminar. Um, I, when I suggested this, Nikki was like, yeah, that sounds like a good idea. These are ideas that you probably haven't heard before. Um, so I thought it might be of more interest to people um, than perhaps, you know, you know, let's talk about statutory warranties under the Home Building Act or the Building Act. Um, so I can take questions now um, if that's what people want to do. Nikki, what, what would you like? Well, first of all, I'd like to say thanks to you, Christopher, because that, it is a different format to what we're used to, but I think it's been really valuable information that you've provided us. It's been a really great insight into, into what you've seen out there as well with committees and with buildings. Uh, we've had some comments come through while you were speaking, and I think at this point probably we're best to address those first because it's probably more relevant um, on the end of what you were just saying. So some yep. of the things, if you're happy to do that, some of the things um, John commented, committees and owners in anger or denial need a sympathetic lawyer to equate them with the reality, um, generalising lawyers who are focused on telling owners what they have to do or not get as much traction as lawyers who consult with owners and share the pain and take them on the journey with them, if you just wanted to comment on that at all. or uh, So let's just uh, give me a time for that one because it's 66 uh, <laughs> Yeah, I, don't, I, I copy them down and stick them in another oh, folder because I lose them so quickly. That was at 10 13. Oh, yeah, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. It was towards the beginning. So these are yeah. in time order. Yeah. Yeah, that's it. Look, there. It's, it's, yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, look, yeah, that's right. Um, it's, it's, I mean, in another life, I acted for, you know, large contractors and government. And on many occasions, my clients were in house lawyers. And so it's a very different experience when your client is another lawyer as to when your client is a lay person who is um, confused and, 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 and also worried about both the, the problem they have in front of them and whether their lawyer will screw them over. Um, so yeah, it, it's, it does require a different skill set to deal with lay people, to, uh, to be patient and to try and explain things because you know, it's, it's like me going to a, a orthopedic surgeon. You know, I have no idea what, what orthopedics is all about um, so it's a similar sort of situation. So it's it, it can take a, a lot more patience, a lot more time to kind of get there. Um, and it is something that needs to be kept in mind. 
Um, okay, and I've just pulled a few of these out. I certainly haven't picked sure. all of them, but there was one from Robin for just underneath that 714. Um, yeah. what, re what responsibility does a strata manager have in assisting the body corporate in getting or owners corporations in getting defects fixed by the builder for new properties? Well, um, <laughs> poor strata managers. Um, so the thing about strata managers is, and strata managers can be people pleasers, right? They just want to keep people happy. And, um, and so sometimes that comes back to haunt them because it gives an impression of what their role and responsibility is. Um, the strata manager has a contract with the owners corporation that management agreement. And the management agreement is basically <clears throat> collect the levies, call the meeting, uh, draft the agenda, uh, draft the minutes of the meeting, uh, attend executive committee meetings and do the same. Um, it's actually just a limited number of things they're required to do. Um, unfortunately, um, as I said, that they can, excuse me, be people pleasers and give the impression that, well, they're just a concierge for the building and and a kind of gopher and so any kind of miscellaneous tasks that arise um, can land on their plate very quickly and, um, and and strata managers are not great at explaining to owners exactly what their job is uh, and why that job is worth the money that people are paying them for sometimes people get confused about you know they see the insurance they, they see the levies being struck and they think all those levies are going into the pocket of the strata manager Whereas the reality is they're going to pay a whole bunch of things that have got nothing to do with the strata manager, like insurance policies, utilities, all these things. And people can kind of not understand exactly what that role is. Um, so it's not really the responsibility of the strata manager to ensure that the body corporate um, fix defects. Um, the strata manager should obviously um, indicate to the um, owners that they need to take legal advice, they need to get technical engineering or building advice. Um, but ultimately, <clears throat> it's the owner's responsibility. Um, under, your, under the management agreement, um, there are usually caps on liability and the cap on liability is just, I think, a year of fees or something. So if people can, people frequently come to me and say, I wanna sue my strata manager for this or that. And I'm like, well, you're going to struggle because it, this wasn't part of their contract and establishing a duty of care is probably going to be problematic. And then you've got this cap on liability that you've got to get over. You know, people don't understand that the responsibilities of the strata manager is actually quite limited. Um, so I, I could talk for hours about that, but we'll, we'll stop there. <laughs> Okay, and this is a question from a strata manager, um, Edward Baker, and he's saying, uh, I've been through this process with Chris on a few large projects, and I feel it's important to let the owners know from the first AGM or before that, this is going to be part of their lives for the next five years to manage emotions from the onset. Yeah, so Ed, Ed and I have been through this a few times. Um, and yeah, it, it is important that they settle in for the ride, as it were. Unfortunately, these things... Um, don't take six months to resolve. Um, whether you're going to litigate or enter into uh, some form of negotiation with the builder whereby the builder comes back and rectifies things, which is my preferred way of dealing with things and usually the way I get the results. Um, um, it just takes time. You know, these buildings can be uh, anything from 50 to 300 owners or apartments. And you know, for, for a builder to come back and do defect rectification work to hundreds of apartments just takes huge amounts of time. And then even prior to them actually doing the work, they need to work out what are the defects, um, how are the defects caused, how do we rectify the defects? So typically you go through a process of prototype repairs where you find the worst apartment, identify the defects, um, work out what the fix is, test, 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 okay, that fix actually does properly fix that defect. We now roll out that rectification methodology over all the apartments and you'll have you know, eight different defect sets, each with its own prototype methodology. It is, it is a process that can take years to go through. Um, you know, with, with the tier one contractors, you know, your Lend Leases, uh, your Hutchies, your Mervacs, um, 
you know, these are organizations that have line items in their accounting that deal with or provision for these sorts of works. Um, so these negotiations with these tier one contractors usually go pretty well. Um, as you kind of come down the ranks to the smaller and smaller operations that don't necessarily provision for these things, then it might become a bit problematic. But with the larger scale buildings, the, the buildings of hundreds of units, you tend to get the larger organizations that do actually have accountants that say, okay, we need to put aside $5 million a year, for this sort of work. Yeah. Okay, if we jump to uh, around about seven minutes 18, oh, sorry, 10 minutes 18, I'm on WA time for anyone not knowing that. Yeah. Um, so Peter um, had asked, uh, the stress is all on the EC to get through the initial stages of the process and the different EC members have different risk profiles. Yeah, I mean, P Peter and I went through this process uh, in a building in Canberra. Um, and yeah, look, th th there is... Unfortunately, this process uh, involves a lot of work by at least one member of the EC and usually organized ECs put a, establish like a subcommittee that reports to the executive committee. And that subcommittee then kind of does the everyday work in terms of you know, liaising with the building consultant who's acting for the owners corporation and, and looking to see what's going on and who's on site and what's, you know, when things are going to happen and so forth. So it, it does absorb a lot of time. And that's why, as I said, you know, <clears throat> a recently re a recent retiree is, is the ideal person who, who can deal with these things. Then we'll jump to uh, uh, 26 minutes past. It was a message from John and you were speaking about the builder putting off um, the the fixing of the repairs yep. until they fall out of the statutory period. So he's asking yep. when a builder puts off things deliberately on limited limitation periods, uh, are, they, are they conducting criminal activity? Surely criminal no. activity should be pursuable if they get away with it. No, look, um, it, it really depends on the circumstances. You might be able to run an unconscionable conduct argument of some sort in, in very obvious situations where um, a builder has really acted um, in a devious sort of way, but generally speaking, no. Um, and, and, and look, there are, for example, in the ACT, uh, there is provision in the Limitation Act where you can extend limitation period out to as much, I think, as 15 years, but, you know, you need to satisfy a range of conditions um, to, sat, to be able to extend the limitation period in that way. And one of them, for example, is if you've taken legal advice uh, or, or, you know, have heard or researched matters and, and become aware of a limitation period issue, then that's going to stop the court from <coughs> extending the limitation period of 15 years. So it really does turn on the particular circumstances of the owners. Um, but I'm just saying that there are unscrupulous builders and developers out there who will kind of, um, you know, they, they will come back and they will, they will do work that really either gives the impression they're going to do further work or, you know, fixes the problem for, say, three years via some sort of silicon um, gun and then knowing full well that the root of the problem has been solved and this problem will reappear again in three or four years' time, but the builder is just trying to get things over the line. Okay, and John also mentions, I, I guess, on top of that, that builders often shut down their company when legal action's taken and then reset up on under another name to avoid fixing defects yeah. and avoid any legal repercussions. So I don't know, is there anything that you wanted to comment on that or? Yeah, look, that, that as you come down the um, size of the organisation, um, that becomes more of a problem. Um, it's not unusual for smaller builders to flip their companies every four or five years, and that kind of cleans the slate in terms of liabilities. Um, the tier one contractors don't do that. It's just, they're, they're, they're a bit more concerned about reputation. Um, um, I know, and I had to, like, what's extraordinary is, um, I looked up the Hutchinson's um, company search, or did a company search of Hutchinson's, and that company has been around since 1968 in its original form. So those large companies don't do that. It's just as you kind of 
fall down in, in the size of the building companies, you get more and more of that kind of flipping companies every four or five years. So that becomes a factor in working out the strategy and dealing with the builder because you always got your eye on the fact that, you know, he's probably going to be moving that, flipping that company over and beginning to operate under another company. Uh, this one, I don't know whether it's really in the scope of today's um, talk, but I'll mention it anyway, just in case you're able to answer. Um, Grace at um, 38 minutes past has asked uh, whether there's a limitation period for action against local council for a started building from 1976. <laughs> um, so look, there's limitation periods for all actions, generally speaking, uh, including actions against local council. Um, you know, 1976 is well and truly beyond any, um, you know, you've lost, but if the building was finished in 1976, you've lost any rights you would have had. And it's important to bear in mind also that um, buildings do have a design life. Um, you know, I actually worked on the uh, Commonwealth Parliament House um, uh, back in 1988 and, you um, that building had a 200 year design life. Uh, most building and, and that required a, quali a level of quality workmanship and materials that was well beyond the norm. And so people should bear in mind that um, buildings don't have, aren't designed to last hundreds of years. They're designed to last you know, 50 or, or more years. And so that's why limitation periods kick out at six or seven years or whatever, depending on the jurisdiction. And so, um, you know, 1976, you're starting to think about, you know, perhaps replacing the building or upgrading it or whatever. Okay, we've got one that's probably topical at the moment. Um, it's from David. Um, right now, our building has massive water leaks. This is at 39 minutes past, uh, Chris. Yeah. has massive water leak problems out, but it's been so wet in Sydney. The builders keep delaying waterproofing coming, waterproofers coming because it's so wet. What else can I do legally to push this through and get some traction while it's so wet? Um, the builder and developer are dodgy and always say one thing, but never follow up on many matters. Yep. Yeah. Look, um, there's two things about that. Firstly, um, you know, the, the, the rain situation at the moment is extraordinary. Um, when waterproofing is put down, um, in order to satisfy the manufacturer's warranty, um, there are quite stringent conditions required. Um, depending on the particular waterproofing membrane you have, um, you know, the temperature has to be between you know, X degrees and Y degrees. You know the the membrane needs to be allowed to cure, and it needs X days to cure. Um, uh, I, I'm, I'm, I don't. I think you know the conditions need to be. Um, you know, I, I, I'd be surprised if you could lay down waterproofing membrane when the slab was quite wet. Um, so bear in mind that there are conditions around um, when you can lay down a waterproofing membrane. Um, the other thing is um, waterproofing membrane, there, there's, there are a lot of new technologically new products around that sometimes builder, builders over rely on in finding solutions to problems. And rather than kind of think through an issue, um, they can kind of just go, oh, we'll just throw down this membrane, it'll be fine. And so owners need to keep in mind, you know, what exactly are they doing here? Um, are they just putting down the old membrane? The membrane also has to be of a certain thickness, right? There's a minimum thickness required requirement for membranes to be, because they need to expand and contract in the heat and in the cold. And so if the membrane is too thin, it's not gonna work. Anyway, um, so it's important always to have um, a third party expert who is advising the owners as to whether or not what the builder is doing is appropriate or not. And so, um, so getting, making sure that, I mean, getting the builder to come back and do work is one thing, but you want the builder to come back and do work that actually fixes the problem, not just as a cheap fix that gets another five years out of the, the building without a problem. So, um, David, I can't comment on that particular situation. I, I don't know. I don't know the build, I don't know the timeframes, I don't know any of these things, um, but 
you know, there, there are issues around laying waterproofing and conditions required. But um, I think it's also important there that you know that 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 water, the, the laying down waterproofing membrane in that circumstance is the right solution. Is it the right product they're using, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, and then I might just jump to one of the questions that we did have submitted uh, prior to the event, Chris. And I do apologise um, to people who have sent questions in and we haven't actually gotten to them yet. It's just that some of them were a little bit out of scope for what the talk was about. But this one I think was really interesting and it was the one to do with the, the two-door lift, Chris, from Rob. Um, our building has a two-door lift which opens onto a garden area and the door is open to the weather and admits water when it rains. The water accumulates in the lift well and needs to be pumped out. The lift door needs to be waterproofed and the steel fittings in the lift well rust proofed. The building's still in the defect liability period. However, the builder developer refuses to accept this as a defect on the grounds that it's a problem with the original design and rectification is the responsibility of the OC. Uh, so the question that I found really interesting is can a distinction like this between design and defect be made and should the OC dispute the position taken by the builder? Um, look, the, the 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 thing about this is I can't answer like if I answer this question I'm answering it with nothing like the number of facts that I need to know to answer it correctly. <clears throat> Having said that, um, there are basically three broad causes of defects in apartment buildings or any buildings really. Firstly, um, poor work, poor workmanship by the builder, poor or negligent design by a designer. So an architect, an engineer of some sort, or a combination of poor workmanship or neg and negligent design. Um, that the, the distinction between workmanship and design is, a, is an important one because professional indemnity insurance applies to design work. It doesn't apply to um, workman, poor workmanship. Um, if you're three stories or less in ACT or New South Wales, there is um, a home warranty insurance that covers you for breaches of statutory warranties, but that's different to um, professional indemnity insurance for negligent design work. So it's important that you understand the distinction there. Now, um, in New South Wales, not the ACT, New South Wales, we've seen the introduction of a statutory duty of care that makes it a lot easier to sue um, designers in uh, negligence. Um, that's under the Design and Building Practitioners Act. That, the, the introduction of the statutory duty of care was the first part of that act. The second part of that act is um, the introduction of registration requirements for engineers and architects and so forth, and um, the issues around registered designs and so forth. So in New South Wales, there has been a great focus on um, um, you know, being able to recover or making it easier to recover for negligent design work by designers and builders. Um, some builders do have in-house design teams, some don't. Um, so it really depends on, um, uh, you know, a whole range of factors, but can a distinction like this between design and a defect or workmanship be made? The answer is a resounding yes. Um, but going beyond that, it's a lot more complicated. Okay, thank you. And we might just jump, there was one from Terence um, at 46 minutes, and that was when fixing a defect in the, is the strata committee obliged to provide a permanent um, fix or just provide a temporary fix? Uh, oh, I see, uh, that's the next one. Um, <laughs> Well, the, 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 there is, as I said uh, earlier on, a statutory duty, section 106 of the Strata Schemes Management Act and section 24 of the Unit Titles Management Act for New South Wales and the ACT. There's a statutory duty for owners corporations to repair and maintain common property. And the view is that, well, that's a proper permanent fix. Um, the problem with a <clears throat> temporary fix is it still doesn't fix the problem. And when the problem re-arises, then the statute of duty requires it to be fixed again. And so, um, you know, generally speaking, 
I would have thought that it's better to fix things permanently rather than temporarily because ultimately it's going to be cheaper. You're not going to get the same um, anger and time and money issues that arise from dealing with the same issue over and over again um, because you know you just want to get it fixed and then everyone can let it go rather than having this recurring problem over and over again which wastes people's time wastes people's money you know and just creates you know aggro um yeah Okay, thanks, Chris. I think now, did you have anything else? We're probably exhausted. I probably put you through so many, <laughs> so many questions there, and uh, you've answered them really well. And thank you for sticking with us. Is there anything else that you noticed in there that you would like to to comment on at all before we finish up today? Uh, no, no. Uh, I'm. I'm uh, there were <laughs> there have been a lot of comments, um, uh, and to be honest, I've been focusing on talking rather than reading the comments. So, um, but look, uh, no, I'm 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 fine. Okay, excellent. And thank you, everyone. The discussion was really great. It was really good to see. And I think we weren't able to get to all of the, the questions that were asked in there, but some people have had sort of little mini discussions in there while we were talking, which is really great to see. Um, and they've been sharing information. So we really appreciate that. Uh, so thanks very much. Um, yeah, okay. So we might just finish up at the end of the session, Chris, I always ask whether you've got any information personally or about Karen Benson lawyers that you'd like to share with us. Um, any update on a new book that you've got coming out or anything that you uh, can well, for the ACT, I, for those who don't know, I, I wrote the book on ACT strata law. Um, I, the ACT government has told me that the new amendments to the Unit Titles Management Act will occur in February, March at this stage uh, next year. And so the second edition of my book will be after that. There's no point publishing a book until all the amendments are there so it'll probably hopefully be mid next year or something like that but but let's see um, okay. obviously our website is there karenmansonlawyers.com.au if you want to know more about the firm excellent thank you so much thanks for joining us for this educational session if you gained value from the information please like this video you can also engage further with look up strata by subscribing to our youtube channel or by being kept informed about strata news via our regular newsletters our subscribe link is listed in the description box below